been reserved for the king's pleasure. Therefore the king's portion is reserved for you. A prepared position awaits you with the king of kings sitting at the head of the table. He desires that you sup with him in the presence of your enemies. By accepting his personal invitation, your needs are met, the desires of your heart fulfilled, and to top it off you will receive the exceeding abundant above all you can ask for or even think of. Imagine that. The more you understand the king's heart, without a shadow of a doubt, you will begin to make more room for heaven's treasures. Welcome to King's Question. This is Catherine Joy Foster. And the theme of our program today is the Tsunami Blessing Inside and Out. And this is part 50. Now, any of the lessons, you can go back to our blog and receive all the scriptures that we use for each lesson for probably the past 25 lessons. Today, we are going to look at being handpicked by God. We're going to use David as an example, as well as look at the various correlating psalms that go along with each subject that we're going to talk about today. The first item we're going to address is being irreplaceable to God. We look at at David being crowned king. It first took place when he was actually anointed by Samuel the prophet. And here is God coming to Samuel in 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, the first to the 14th verses. And we'll use some verses from the living Bible. And this is finally the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned here long enough for Saul, for I rejected him as king of Israel. Now take a vial of olive oil and go up to Bethlehem and find a man named Jesse, for I've selected one of his sons to be the new king. Now God actually rejected Saul because Saul rejected God. But Samuel said to God, how can I do that? If Saul hears of this, he'll kill me. God says to him, take a heifer with you and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Then call Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you which of his sons to anoint. So Samuel did as the Lord told him. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the city came trembling to meet him. He said, what is wrong? They asked, why have you come? But he replied, all is well. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And as he performed the purification rite on Jesse and his son and invited them to, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the man God has chosen. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by man's faith or height, for this is not the one. I don't make decisions that way. Men judge by the outward appearance, but I look at a man's thoughts and intentions, and I'll just add the thoughts and intentions of his heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel, but the Lord said, this is not the right man either. Next, Jesse summons Shama, but the Lord said, no, this is not the one. In the same way, all seven of his sons presented themselves to Samuel and were rejected. The Lord has not chosen any of these, Samuel told Jesse. Are these all there are? Well, there's the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the field watching the sheep. Send for him at once, Samuel said, for we will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was a fine looking boy, ruddy face with pleasant eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one 
anoint him. You see, this was Kairos time when God's moment meets God's time in your life. So David stood there among his brothers. Samuel took the olive oil he brought and poured it upon David's head. And the spirit of Jehovah came upon him and gave him great power from that day forward. You see, when God anoints you physically with oil, he backs it up with the spirit of of God. So that means that this is all of God in all of you that can work through you. But it also says, but the spirit of the Lord left Saul and he ended up having a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. See, God is not confused. Once he anointed David, he says, David, you are irreplaceable. I can only anoint one king over Israel at one time. So you have to know that when God chooses you, you are re irreplaceable. You are irreplaceable when God chooses you. It doesn't matter who rejects you. Now we're going to look at Psalm 2 in the Passion Translation because we're going to look at the coronation of the king. And this is what the nations would say. How dare the nations plan a rebellion? Their foolish plots are futile. Look how the power brokers of the world rise up to hold their summit as the rulers scheme and confer together against Yahweh and his anointed king saying, let's come together and break away from the creator. Once and for all, let's cast off these controlling chains of God and his Christ. But the yoke that we carry is to show that we expressly belong to him as one united front. Let's move on. It says, now God enthroned merely laughs at them. The sovereign one mocks their madness. Then with the fierceness of his fiery anger, he settles the issue and terrifies them to death with these words. I myself have poured out my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So he is speaking through David, but also to Jesus and also to us because we inherit the ministry of Jesus. And this is what Jesus would say in verse 7. It says, and I will reveal the eternal purpose of God, for he has decreed over me. You are my favored son. And as your father, I have crowned you as my king eternal. Today, I became your father. Ask me to give you the nations and I will do it. And they shall become your legacy. That's down to us. Your domain will stretch to the ends of the earth. That is through us. And you shall shepherd them with unlimited authority, crushing their rebellion as an iron rod smashes jars of clay. Now, this is in the voice of the Holy Spirit, beginning in verse 10. It says, listen to me, all you rebel kings and all you upstart judges of the earth. Learn your lesson while there's still time. Serve and worship the awe-inspiring God. Recognize his greatness and bow before him, trembling with reverence in his presence. Fall face down before him. Kiss the sun before his anger is aroused against you. Remember that his wrath can be quickly kindled. But many blessings are waiting for all who turn aside to hide themselves in him. So what message will we like to leave with you today? You have been handpicked by God to live his dream in the earth moment by moment. Being compassed with God's favor as a shield is similar to hosting the brilliance of a spotlight that gloriously illuminates you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Because it's all directional, you stay completely covered by his wraparound presence from the east, west, north, 
south, above, beneath, inside and out. And I'll be right back after this message from my sponsor. The Catherine Joy Foster Music Ministries is a 21st century multimedia marketplace ministry. In your discovery, you will find the power of God present to go where you are, to take you where Jesus is, raising you up, repairing you, restoring you, so that you can be as Jesus is in this world. Now available for workshops, banquets, conferences, webinars, concerts, prayer meetings. You can call area code 216-486-8615, extension 1. Again, that's area code 216-486-8615, extension 1. Proud to be an advertiser for King's Portion Web Radio. Welcome back to King's Portion. Again, the theme of our program today is a tsunami blessing inside and out. You have been handpicked by God to live his dream in the earth moment by moment. Being compassed with God's favor as a shield is similar to hosting the brilliance of a spotlight that gloriously illuminates you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Because it's all directional, you stay completely covered by his wraparound presence from the east, west, north, south, above, beneath, inside, and out. So you are not only to God seen as irreplaceable, but also irresistible. And that has two meanings. One, it means you attract the right people to you, but also two, you repel the wrong people from getting to you or staying by you. Now we're going to look at David being handpicked by God to be the conqueror. Now in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, the Living Bible, is showing here that now the Philistines are trying to war against the Israelites. And they have a champion, Goliath, who is over nine feet tall. He has a bronze helmet, a 200 pound coat of mail, bronze leggings, and he carries a bronze javelin several inches thick, tipped with a 25-pound iron spearhead. And his armor berry walked ahead of him with a huge shield. And he would taunt them day and night for 40 days. And that created terror for the whole army. This is what happened. You have to realize during this time that Saul has been rejected by God. So the anointing that he had to face an enemy is not there, but fear is, torment is. David's brothers, his three oldest brothers, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah had all volunteered for Saul's army to fight the Philistines. And here's David. He will go back and forth to the palace on a part-time basis to play for Saul. So one day, this is Cairo's time, Jesse sends David and tells him to go and see how his brothers are doing and take some food to them and to the captains as well. So the next day, he left and he got there really quick and had everything in place. So when he got there, he saw Goliath taunting Israel. And he says, he's looking for a man who would come and fight him. And then whoever won, they would serve the other one because they had killed the champion. But what he didn't know is that David was not just a champion. He was a conqueror. And this is what David said as he was finding out what the rewards of the fight is because you want to make sure that when you're fighting a war that the rewards are high enough for you to even contest it he says now what will a man get for killing this philistine and ending this insult to israel 
He said, who is this heathen Philistine anyway that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And they said, well, they'll get the king's daughter as a wife and his whole family be exempted from paying taxes. So his brother comes up, the oldest one, Eliab, and he was very angry and he demanded from him, what are you doing here anyway? Now, what about those little sheep that you supposed to be taking care of? I know you are a cocky brat and you just came to see the battle. Well, David knew that Eliab was not the one he's supposed to fight. So he asked a question to the question that was asked him. He says, what have I done now? I was only asking a question. So he didn't even address him even more than that. But then this is what King Saul hears about David. And so he calls for him. And David told him that he didn't have to worry about a thing. He would take care of this Philistine. And Saul says, don't be ridiculous. How can a kid like you fight a man like him? You're only a boy and he's been in the army since he was a boy. But David persisted. Why? Because he already knew he was a conqueror. He says, I'm going to tell you the story. When I have been taking care of my father's sheep and a lion and a bear comes and grabs a lamb from the flock, I go after with a club and I take the lamb from his mouth. If it turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this both with lions and bears, and I will do this to this heathen Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from the claws and teeth of the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. So Saul consented. He said, may the Lord be with you. But what happened is that he says, okay, well, if I give him my armor that I'm wearing or supposed to be wearing, then it'll camouflage him and they'll think that it's him instead of David. Well, he tried it on. He says, I can't wear these. I haven't even proven them. See, when you go into war, you need to go with what has been proven. He went with the word of God. So he gets out there before Goliath and Goliath is insulted. He's offended. He says, am I a dog that you would come to me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his God. He said, come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. But David replied, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the armies of heaven and of Israel, the very God to whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and take off your head. And what he was doing is inviting God into the fight to actually win the battle for him. He was just going to take the spoils. He says, then I'm going to give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel and Israel will learn that the Lord does not depend on the weapons to fulfill his plan. He works without regard to human means. He will give you to us. That was the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit because when he was anointed king, and that's when the power came upon him. And that is the same power that killed the lions and the bears. And that was the same power that killed Goliath as well. So it says that, you know, he got his stone out of his bag and he hauled it from his sling and it hit Goliath in the forehead and it sank in. And Goliath fell on his face to the ground. So David conquered the Philistine giant with a sling and a stone. So since David didn't have a sword, he ran over and pulled Goliath from his sheep and killed him with it. And then he cut off his head. Now, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. And then the Israelis gave a great shout of triumph and rushed at the Philistines, chasing them all the way back to Gath. And the bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn 
along the road. And then the Israeli army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camp. And that's what happened there. But David says, I'm going to take Goliath's head to Jerusalem with me. And But he stored Goliath's armor in his tent as a trophy. Now let's look at the last fight that David had with the Philistines. And that's in 2 Samuel, the 15th chapter, the 17th through the 24th verses from the Living Bible. So then after David was crowned king, that stirred up the Philistines. And so they spread out to actually attack them. They want to take and capture him. So David, in his humility now, as he's getting older, he understands that I need to honor God. I need to humble myself before God. I need to get the plans from the war room where God sits as the conquering king. So David says to the Lord, shall I go out and fight against them? Will you defeat them for me? And the Lord replied, yes, go ahead, for I will give them to you. So David went and fought them and defeated them. The Lord did it, he exclaimed. He burst through my enemies like a raging flood. So he called the place bursting. That means he called the place the Lord of the breakthrough. So at that time, David and the troops confiscated all the idols. This would be the spoils of war. And they could see that now this is where the Philistines had abandoned their camp. So now they decide to come and fight again with the Israelites. So this time, David still asked God about direction and how sh should he defeat the Philistines if he's supposed to fight them. So now this is what the Lord replied. He says, don't make a frontal attack. Go behind them and come out by the balsam trees. When they hear a sound like marching feet in the tops of the balsam trees attack for it will signify that the Lord has prepared the way for you and will destroy them. Always get your plans from God. Might be the same enemy, but it might be a different approach. So when we look in Psalms, the ninth chapter, the first through the 10th verse from the Passion Translation, you could see how God is being praised by David, who is the Psalms author. And he says, Lord, I will worship you with extended hands as my whole heart explodes with praise. I will tell everybody everywhere about your wonderful works and how your marvelous miracles exceed expectations. I will jump for joy and shout in triumph as I sing your song and make music for the most high God. For when you appear, I worship while all of my enemies run in retreat. They stumble and perish before your presence for you have stood up for my cause and vindicated me when I needed you the most. From your righteous throne, you have given me justice. What a blast of your rebuke. Nations are destroyed. You obliterated their names forever and ever. The Lord thundered and our enemies have been cut off, vanished. In everlasting ruins, all the cities have been destroyed. Even the memory of them have been erased. But the Lord of eternity, our mighty God, lives and reigns forever. He sits enthroned as king, ready to render his verdicts and judge all with righteousness. He will issue his decrees of judgment, deciding what is right for the entire world, dispensing judgment to all. All who are pressed may come to you as a shelter in the time of trouble, a perfect hiding place. May everyone who knows your mercy 
keep putting their trust in you for they can count on you for help no matter what. Oh Lord, you will never, no never neglect those who come to you. So it's showing that how David was a conquering king, we are to be a conquering king. And our position is more than a conqueror because Jesus has already won that battle. So we don't have to win it. We just have to make sure that we maintain their victory that has already been won by Jesus, our conquering king. Now in our program today, you are going to enjoy the music of John Stevens. Now let's welcome him as he sings Your Time. This is Cairo's Time. that he has in store they're already here it's your expectation that led to the statement it's your time it's all for you to you tell you that it's all your, your, your new season new season today God is coming your way God has a master plan I believe I believe I believe us on the web at blog 
blog.kingsportionlive.com. That's blog.kingsportionlive.com. Thanks for staying tuned to King's Portion. Again, the theme Bible program today is a tsunami blessing inside and out. You have been handpicked to live his dream in the earth moment by moment. Being compassed by God's favor as a shield is similar to hosting the brilliance of a spotlight that gloriously illuminates you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Because it's all directional, you stay completely covered by his wraparound presence from the east, west, north, south, above, beneath, inside, and out. So he says, yes, you are irreplaceable to God. You are irresistible to God, but also irresistible to the enemy. Now he gives to us an everlasting covenant. And we're going to look through the eyes of David, but that everlasting covenant is irrevocable. In 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, the first through the fifth verses, it reads, these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse speaks. David, the man to whom God gave such wonderful success. David, the anointed of the God of Jacob. David, sweet psalmist of Israel, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. The rock of Israel said to me, one shall come who rules righteously, who rules in the fear of God. And he shall be as a light of the morning, a cloudless sunrise. When the tender grass springs forth upon the earth as sunshine after rain. And it is my family he has chosen. Yes, God has made an everlasting covenant with me. His agreement is eternal, final, sealed. He will constantly look after my safety and success. Now in the King James Version, this is from the living version that I just read. But in the King James Bible, it says that it's everlasting, sure, ordered in all things and all my desire. And God has caused it to spring forth. Now we're going to look in Psalm 110 from the Passage Translation. And David is actually having a vision where he is actually in the throne room of God with Jesus. And this is what he says. Yahweh says to my Lord, the Messiah, so this is God to Jesus, sit with me as enthroned ruler while I subdue your every enemy. They will bow low before you as I make them a footstool for your feet, which is the body of Christ. And this is David as he continued, Messiah, I know God himself will establish your kingdom as you reign in Zion glory. For he says to you, rule in the midst of your enemies, your people will be your love offerings. In the day of your mighty power, you will be exalted. And in the brightness of your holy ones, you will shine as an army rising from the wound of the dumb, anointed with the dew of your youth. Yahweh has taken a solemn oath and will never and will never back away from it saying, you are a priest for eternity, my king of righteousness. The Lord stands in final authority to shatter to pieces the kings who stand against you on the day he displays his terrible wrath. He will judge every rebellious nation filling their battlefield with corpse and will shatter the strongholds of ruling powers. Yet he himself will drink from his inheritance as from a flowing brook. Refreshed by love, he will stand victorious. Now let's look at what David also says in Psalm 138 division from the Passion Translation. And we're talking about the divine presence. And it says, I thank you, Lord, with all the passion of my heart. I worship you in the presence of angels. 
Heaven's mighty ones will hear my voice as I sing my loving praise to you. I bow down before your divine presence and bring you my deepest worship as I experience your tender love and your living truth. For the promises of your word and the fame of your name has been magnified above all else. At the very moment I called out to you, you answered me. You strengthened me deep within my soul and breathed fresh courage into me. One day all the kings of the earth will rise to give you thanks when they hear the living words that I have heard you speak. He's talking about you being the king as well. He said they too will sing of your wonderful ways. For your ineffable glory is great. For though you are lofty and exalted, you stoop to embrace the lowly. Yet you keep your distance from those who are filled with pride. By your mighty power, I can walk through any devastation and you will keep me alive, reviving me. Your power set me free from the hatred of my enemy. You Keep every promise you've ever made to me. Remember, it's the everlasting covenant where God is covering everything that is weak to make sure that now every weakness you have have been reinforced by his strength. And it continues, since your love for me is constant and endless, I ask you, Lord, to finish every good thing that you begun in me. So he is speaking the generational blessings even down to you. I'll be right back. I was just standing there basking in the sun and all of a sudden I was soaking wet. There wasn't a sign in the sky. So I was unprepared without an umbrella. But in the end, it just didn't matter. I loved every minute of it. I knew I was living under open heavens. It really does give new meaning to being overtaken by blessing. Not a dry spot. This is Fran the Fan of H-D-O-R. Uh-oh, here comes the rain again. been listening to King's Portion Live with web host Catherine Joy Foster. Welcome back to King's Portion. Again, the theme of our program today is the Tsunami Blessing Inside and Out. Now, you have been handpicked by God to live his dream in the earth moment by moment. Being compassed with God's favor as a shield is similar to hosting the brilliance of a spotlight that gloriously illuminates you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet because it's all directional you stay completely covered by his wraparound presence from the east west north south above beneath inside and out so he says that yes just like david was irreplaceable irresistible who had a irrevocable covenant with God. I'm going to look through the lens of David showing how he had a irreversible stance with God where he would not get in God's way. We're going to look at how David has honor before God and humility before God even in the face of his main enemy at this time with Saul. This is before he was even king. This is taken from 1 Samuel, the 26th chapter from the Living Bible. Now, this is Saul being stirred up to get his best troops. It happened to be 3,000 troops, and he went to hunt down David. So they came to the camp where they were going to take him and kill him. But this was at night, and here is King Saul... And his general Abner, they were sleeping inside of a ring formed by slumbering soldiers. David sees them and he asks for a volunteer. So this is Abishai who decides he would go with David. And when they get to the camp, 
where Saul and the rest of them are asleep, and Saul's spear was in the ground beside his head. This is what Abishah says. God has put your enemy within your power this time for sure. And that's what he said to David. He said, let me go and put that spear through him. I'll pin him to the earth with it. I'll never need to strike a second time. David says, no, don't kill him. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's chosen king? Surely God will strike him down some day or he will die in battle or of old age. But God forbid that I should kill the man who was chosen to be king. But I'll tell you what, we'll take his spear and his jug of water and get out of here. So David took the spear and the jug of water and they got away without anybody seeing them because the Lord had put them sound asleep. So they climbed back to the places where the rest of their soldiers were. And David hollers down to Abner and Saul, wake up Abner. Who is it? Abner demanded. Well, Abner, you're a great fellow, aren't you? David taunted. Where in all Israel is there anyone as wonderful? So why haven't you guarded your master, the king, when someone came to kill him? This isn't good at all. I swear by the Lord that you ought to die for your carelessness. Where is the king's spear and the jug of water that was beside his head? Look and see. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that you, my son, David? And David replied, Yes, sir, it is. Why are you chasing me, he says to Saul. What have I done? What is my crime? If the Lord has stirred you up against me, then let him accept my peace offering. But is it simply the scheme of a man? Then may he be cursed by God. For you have driven me out of my home so that I can't be with the Lord's people. And you have sent me away to worship heathen gods. Must I die on foreign soil far from the presence of Jehovah? Why should the king of Israel come out to hunt my life like a partridge on the mountains? Then Saul confessed. I have been wrong. Come back home, my son, and I'll no longer try to harm you, for you saved my life today. I've been a fool and very, very wrong. David says, here is your spear, sir. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord gets his own reward for doing good and for being loyal, and I refuse to kill you even when the Lord placed you in my power. Now, may the Lord save my life, even as I save yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. See, this is David turning the other cheek. What he says, you tried to hit this one. And he turned to him and said, do you want this one? And Saul refused. And this is what he said to David. Blessings on you, my son David. You shall do heroic deeds and be a great conqueror. Then David went away and Saul returned home. Now let's look at the psalm that David penned showing how God defended him. He says, Yahweh, my God, I turn aside to hide my soul in you. Save me from all those who pursue and persecute me. There is none to deliver me but you. Don't let my foes fall upon me like fierce lions with teeth Bared. Can't you see how they want to rip me to shreds? Lord, my God, if I were doing evil things, that would be different. For then I would be guilty, deserving all this. If I've wronged someone at peace with me, if I betrayed a friend repaying evil for good, or if I have unjustly harmed my enemy, then it would be right for you to let my enemy pursue and overtake me. In fact, let them grind me into the ground. Let them take my life from me and drag my dignity in the dust. Pause in his presence. Now, Lord, let your anger rise against the anger of my enemies. Awaken your fury and stand up for me. Decree that justice be done 
against my foes. Gather all the people around you. Return to your place on a high to reside over them and once more occupy the throne of judgment. You are the exalted one who judges the people. So vindicate me publicly and restore my honor and integrity before all the people declare me innocent. Once and for all, end the evil tactics of the wicked. Reward and prosper the cause of the righteous, for you are the righteous judge, the soul searcher, who looks deep into every heart to examine the thoughts and motives. God, your wraparound presence is my protection and my defense. You bring victory to all who reach out for you. Righteousness is revealed every time you judge because of the strength of your forgiveness. Your anger does not break out every day, even though you are a righteous judge. Yet if the wicked do not repent, you will not relent with your wrath, slaying them with your shining sword, which means that's that sword of God that's bathed in heaven. It's not God going on a killing spree as if he were a sniper. Since you are the conqueror with an arsenal of lethal weapons that you prepared for them. You have bent and strung your bow, making your judgment arrows shafts of burning fire. Look how the wicked conceive their evil schemes. They go into labor with their lies and give birth to trouble. They dig a pit for others to fall into, not knowing that they will be the ones, the very ones who will fall into their own pit of failure. For you, Lord God, will see to it that every pit digger who works to trap and harm others will be trapped and harmed by his own treachery. But I will give all my thanks to you, Lord, for you make everything right in the end. I will sing my highest praise to the God of the highest place. Let's also look in Psalm 124th division, and this is also King David. What if God had not been on our side? Let all Israel admit this. If God had not been there for us, our enemies in their violent anger would have swallowed us up alive. The nations with their flood of rage would have swept us away and we would have drowned, perished beneath their torrent of terror. We can praise God over and over that he never left us. God didn't allow the terror of our enemies to defeat us. We are free from the hunter's trap. Their snare is broken and we have escaped. For the same God who made everything our creator and our mighty maker, he himself is our helper and defender. Again on our program, you're going to enjoy the music of John Stevens. Now let's welcome him as he sings Holy Spirit. It is Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that helps us be the habitation of God throughout our time on earth that gives us the mind of Christ, that even in the midst of our enemies, we can forego judgment, knowing that we won't judge a situation too soon, but allow God to be our vindicator. I'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Don't take your spirit from me. Don't 
Take your spirit. We cry yes. Lord, my soul thirsts for you. And so, Lord, I ask you now to take your spirit. Lord, for your presence and your glory. For in it, there's liberty and your power. Lord, for your spirit. And you give me all that I need. And so, Lord, again, I ask you. Oh, come on, if you need a spirit, lift your voice and sing, I desire. I long to seek out.
for staying tuned to King's Portion. Again, the theme of our program today is the Tsunami Blessing Inside and Out. Now, you have been handpicked by God to live his dream in the earth moment by moment. Being compassed with God's favor as a shield is similar to hosting the brilliance of a spotlight that gloriously illuminates you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet because it's all directional you stay completely covered by his wraparound presence from the east west north south above beneath inside and out god's spirit on you just like it was with david and definitely jesus christ makes you irreplaceable and irresistible it gives you a covenant that is irrevocable it also helps you to understand that with your humility and your honor before god that you won't be in his way so even though he might give you the right to do to kill your enemy in battle which is a right he deferred all judgment to god and saying I'm making what you said to me irreversible. You are the judge. And now we're looking at God putting David in a place to being irreproachable to him. Once there is that repentance. The 11th and 12th chapters of 2 Samuel from the Living Bible shows where David is a actually supposed to be at war but he's at home and he couldn't sleep one night so he's taking a stroll on the roof and he sees Bathsheba bathing so he called for her and he slept with her she ended up getting pregnant so she sends word to him that she's pregnant when thing goes wrong there's a potential to try to be so desperate that you are going to try to reverse it. So he's sending for Uriah, who is Bathsheba's husband, to come home to maybe sleep with her so it looks like it'll be his baby instead of the king's baby, which is David. Uriah came home, but he slept in front of the palace instead of going home. What honor this man is showing to David the king. So here is David sending a note back with Uriah to Joab with instructions to send Uriah into battle to kill him. So everything happened just the way David planned it because he was so desperate to get out of what he had done wrong. And when we move into the 12th chapter David is thinking that everything is okay now that he's taken Bathsheba as his wife. But the prophet Nathan comes to David to tell him this story. He said, there were two men in a certain city, one very rich, owning many flocks of sheep and herds of goats, and the other very poor, owning nothing but a little lamb he had managed to buy. It was his children's pet and he fed it from his own plate and let it drink from his own cup he cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter recently a guest arrived at the home of the rich man but instead of killing a lamb from his own flocks for food for the traveler he took the poor man's lamb and roasted it and served it David was furious. I swear by the living God, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing like that should be put to death. He shall repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for not having any pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that rich man. The Lord God of Israel says, I made you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you his palace and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if they had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the laws of God and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah 
and stolen his wife. Therefore, murder shall be a constant threat in your family from this time on because you have insulted me by taking Uriah's wife. I vow that because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will do this to you openly in the sight of all Israel. I have sinned against the Lord, David confessed to Nathan. Nathan replied, yes, but God has forgiven you and you won't die for this, but you have given great opportunity to the enemies of the Lord to despise and blaspheme him. So the child shall die. But you see the clemency of God to cover his chosen ones. And that would also include you. But this is what happened that later on, that David comforted Bathsheba. And when he slept with her, after the baby died, she conceived and gave birth to a son and named him Solomon. And the Lord loved the baby and sent congratulations and blessings through Nathan the prophet. David nicknamed the baby Jedidiah, beloved of Jehovah because of the Lord's interest. Meanwhile, so let's look in Psalm 51 to show just how David moved from confession to cleansing to consecration. Verses 1 through 6 reads like this, and this is from the Passion Translation. God Give me mercy from your fountain of forgiveness. I know your abundant love is enough to wash away my guilt because of your compassion is so great. Take away the shameful guilt of sin. Forgive the full extent of my rebellious ways and erase this deep stain on my conscience for I'm so ashamed. I feel such pain and anguish within me. I can't get away from the sting of my pain against you, Lord. Everything I did, I did right in front of you, for you saw it all against you, and you above all have I sinned. Everything you say to me is infallibly true, and your judgment conquers me, Lord. I have been a sinner from the birth. From the moment my mother conceived me, I know that you delight to set your truth deep in my heart. So come into the hidden places of my heart and teach me wisdom. And then in verses 7 through 11, a show David's cleansing. And he says, purify my conscience. Make this leper clean again. Wash me in your love until I am pure in heart. Satisfy me in your sweetness and my song of joy will return. The places within me you have crushed will rejoice in your healing touch. Hide my sins from your face. Erase all my guilt by your saving grace. Create a new clean heart within me. Fill me with pure thoughts and holy desires ready to please you. May you never reject me. May you never take from me your sacred spirit. And then in verses 12 through 19, it's David's consecration. And he says, let my passion for life be restored. Tasting joy in every breakthrough you bring to me. Hold me close to you with a willing spirit that obeys whatever you say. Then I can show to other guilty ones how loving and merciful you are. They will find their way back home to you knowing that you will forgive them. Oh God, my saving God, deliver me fully from every sin, even the sin that brought blood guilt. Then my heart will once again be thrilled to sing the passionate songs of joy and deliverance. Lord God, unlock my heart, unlock my lips, and I will overcome with my joyous praise. For the source of your pleasure is not my performance 
or the sacrifices I might offer to you, the fountain of your pleasure is found and the sacrifice of my shattered heart before you. You will not despise my tenderness as I humbly bow down at your feet because you favor Zion. Do what is good for her. Be the protecting wall around Jerusalem. And when we are fully restored, you will rejoice and take delight in every offering of our lives as we bring our sacrifices of righteousness before you in love. How precious. So you could see here that this is David coming clean before God so that he can be clean and sanctified and restored to him. But you might be saying in your heart that you need the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. And you can do that now. Why don't you say this prayer after me? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I recognize that I have sinned against you. And I ask you to cleanse me with your blood, the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. Then I will be clean. And I invite you to come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. I dedicate my heart to you so that you can be my Lord. And I thank you for my salvation, for now I know that all things have been made new in the old life have passed away. And I thank you for my new birth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you said that prayer, why don't you email us at info at kingsportionlive.com. That's info at kingsportionlive.com. And we'll send you some encouragement along the way. Now, let's return to the remaining portions of King's Portion Live after this message from my sponsor. We invite you to visit our new interactive website. Please log on to www.kingsportionlive.org. That's www.kingsportionlive.org. We believe that you will discover something that will speak to the royal blood in you. Thanks for staying tuned for the conclusion of our program today that bears the theme, the tsunami blessing inside and out. Now you have been handpicked by God to live his dream in the earth moment by moment. Being compassed by God's favor as a shield is similar to hosting the brilliance of the spotlight that gloriously illuminates you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet because it's all directional. You stay completely covered by his wraparound press from the east, west, north, south, above, beneath, inside, and out. So we said that God's anointing on you makes you irreplaceable, irresistible. You have an irrevocable covenant. And then in that covenant, there is an irreversibility that you give to God, that you are not stepping in his way. When you have the right to judge, but you defer all judgment to him, even in the face of your enemies. And then to be irreproachable before God, that his mercy endures forever. So now you're allowing to receive the mercies of the Lord. And then the last thing I'm going to say is irrefutable. That you have been handpicked by God to usher in Jesus Christ's ministry as a catalyst for him. And what we find that this irrefutability is the impossibility to be disproved. So we can see, even though they were rejecting Jesus, they may reject you. This irrefutability gives you another state of honor. And with that, secession can come forth. In First Chronicles, the 22nd chapter from the Living Bible, 
shows how David wanted to build the temple of the Lord. And so he got everything prepared for him to, to do just that. But God came to him and said, he shall not build the temple because he had too much blood shed on his hand, but that he would have a son and this son would be a man of peace. And God will give him the peace with even his enemies in the surrounding lands. And his name should be called Solomon, named Peaceful. And I'll give peace and quietness to Israel during his reign. And he'll build my temple and he shall be as my son. And I'll be his father and I will cause his sons and his descendants, that's you and me, to reign over every generation. It says of Israel, but now we know that that is also throughout the world. So now my son, this is David to Solomon, may the Lord be with you and prosper you as he has told you to do and to build the temple of the Lord. And may the Lord give you good judgment to follow all his laws when he makes you king of Israel. For if you carefully obey the laws and regulations that he gave to Israel through Moses, you will prosper. So be strong and courageous, fearless and enthusiastic by hard work. This is what David collected. $3.2 billion worth of silver and gold. And it was bronze. Everything that you can think of, it couldn't even be weighed or counted. It was so much. And then not only that, but this is what David did further. He ordered the people around Solomon to assist his son in the project as well. So he told Solomon to get to work, but this is what he declared for everyone. And that would say, including us as well too. The Lord, your God is with you. He declared, he has given you peace with the surrounding nation for I have conquered them in the name of the Lord and for his people. Now try with every fiber of your being to obey the Lord, your God, and you will be soon bringing in the ark and the other holy vessels of worship into the temple of the Lord. Please look at this, is that we are now the temple of the Lord. We are now hosting the presence of the Lord and the anointing and the power of the Lord. So when we usher him in as King and Lord, then he fully expresses himself in every area that we need. First, we're going to look at Psalm 16 from the Passion Translation, because this is David saying, this is the golden secret. Keep me safe, almighty God. I run for dear life to you, my safe place. So I said to the Lord God, you are my maker, my mediator, and my master. Any good thing you find in me has come from you. And he said to me, my holy lovers are wonderful, majestic ones, my glorious ones, fulfilling all my desires. Yet there are those who yield to their weakness and they will have troubles and sorrows unending. I never gather with such ones, nor give them honor in any way. Lord, I've chosen you alone as my inheritance. You are my prize, my pleasure, and my portion. I leave my destiny and its timing in your hands. So he said, this is Cairo's time, but I'm leaving in you to get me there at the right time with the right opportunity. He said, your pleasant path leads me to pleasant Places. I'm overwhelmed by the privileges that come with following you, for you have given me the best. The way you counsel and correct me makes me praise you more. For your whispers in the night give me wisdom, showing me what to do next. Because you are close to me and always available, my confidence will never be shaken. For I experience your wraparound presence every moment. My heart and my soul explode with joy full of glory. Even my body will rest confident and secure for you will not abandon me to the realm of death. Nor will you allow your Holy One to experience corruption for you will bring me a continual resurrection life, the path to the bliss that brings me face to face with 
you. So that was David's golden secret. It's going to lead us to the glorious king that you'll find that he has drafted this psalm, Psalm 24, from the Passion Translation that leads us straight to the king of glory. So now it's not just we have the hope of glory in us. But the, when we realize the hope that's in us, we'll see the king of glory in all his beauty, Jesus Christ. So let's read that. It says, God claims the world as his. Everything and everyone belongs to him. He's the one who pushed back oceans to let the dry ground appear, planting firm foundations for the earth. Who then ascends into the presence of the Lord and who has a privilege of entering the into God's holy place? Those who are clean, whose works and ways are pure, whose hearts are true and sealed by the truth. Those who never deceive, those whose words are sure, they will receive God's blessing and righteousness given by Savior God. They will stand before God for they seek the pleasure of God's face. The God of Jacob pause in his presence. So wake up you living gateway, the gates of the city he's talking about. Lift up your heads, you ageless doors of destinies. Now he's talking about the doors of our heart. Welcome the king of glory for he is about to come through for you. And that's Jesus welcoming him in as Lord and Savior in your life because we become the carriers of the anointing. Welcome the king of glory for he is about to come through you. You ask, who is the king of glory? The Lord armed and ready for battle, the mighty one invincible in every way. So wake up, you living gateways and rejoice. Fling wide you ageless doors of destiny. Here he comes. The king of glory is ready to come in. You ask, who is the king of glory? He is the Lord of victory, armed and ready for battle. The mighty one, the invincible commander of heaven's host. Yes, he is the king of glory. Pause in his presence. So what would we like to leave for you today? The anointing of our Holy Spirit floods you with God himself. He guides you into the Kairos time down to the nanosecond. Then you can witness your due season becoming your now season, which is your new season. Old things have really passed away. Now the destiny of God that he has designed for you awaits you. It's your invincible necessity, as the 1828 Webster's Dictionary proclaims. Now make your calling and election sure, so God is empowered to spread out in you and through you. This is Catherine Joy Foster for King's Portion, where we speak to the royal blood in you. You have been listening to The King's Portion with radio host Catherine Joy Foster. Today's podcast is available for download. Log on to blog.kingsportionlive.com or email info at kingsportionlive.com.